So what exactly is up with this Linux thing? So you've probably seen Linux. There's all of these Linux machines in here. There's only like two or three, maybe five Windows machines in the main lab, a couple Macs. I mean, what exactly do we use these things for? Well, here's a short history of Linux. Linux was written in 1991 by Linus Torvalds. Linus Torvalds is kind of a centric guy who took basically what was the AT&T System 7 implementation of Unix and then wrote essentially a brand new operating system. There's some evidence that he based large sections of it off of the AT&T source code, but I mean by and large it's essentially a rewrite. Um, it's written primarily in C version 89 as well as x86 assembler. So reading the source code is a bit of a doozy. Um, you could also potentially say that it's written in macros. Um, if you've seen anything with macros in C. No, I haven't gotten there yet. But it's really kind of a mess. It uses a Unix-like file structure. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the kernel is still actively being developed today by both Linus Torvalds as well as other open source contributors. In fact, if you wanted to dive in and learn basically this dialect called kernel C, you could potentially start contributing to the Linux kernel if you wanted to. So let's go ahead and lay down some definitions. Um, you've probably heard people talk about Linux distributions. So what is a distribution? How is it different than an operating system? So Ubuntu is a Linux distribution. Fedora is a Linux distribution. Um, you may have heard of the BSD-based operating systems. Those are actually complete operating systems. In other words, they're paired with a collection of user tools in addition to the operating system, which is the kernel. Uh, the kernel itself, we'll talk about in a minute, but it's basically what makes Linux Linux. Um, they have many similarities, namely the kernel, um, but they may differ in their desktop environment, which is basically the actual screen that you see and interact with. You'll see the package manager, um, which is how you install software in a Linux or a Unix environment be different. You'll see differing default applications, like for example, Firefox may be the default web browser in one distribution where it may be Chrome in another. Um, and you'll also see lots of different behind the scenes settings that are different. For example, some will use what is called System D, which is kind of the newer init system that is used in Linux systems. And while well, you'll see other systems and behind the scenes things in other distributions. So some common distributions that we mentioned, you said that you'd used Ubuntu before. Um, Ubuntu and its children, Xbuntu, Kbuntu, Subuntu, they're all kind of related based off what's a distribution called Debian. Debian is one of the oldest Linux distributions in existence and probably still one of the most important. Um, almost all Linux distributions are based off of the Debian uh, distribution and it's pretty much the granddaddy of Linux. Um, Fedora is one of the Red Hat based distributions. There's uh, basically when you're talking about commercial versions of Linux there's basically two major ones or three major ones. There's um, Ubuntu which is hosted by Canonical, OpenSUSE or which is based off SUS Enterprise Linux and then there's the Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is based out of Red Hat. Fedora is the community version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, Arch Linux is a rolling distribution based roughly off of Debian Linux, um, but it's not for the faint of heart. If you want to learn Linux, though, it's a great way to do it. Um, basically, you configure everything. Is, uh, is Debian the first? Debian is not the first um, distribution of Linux to exist. Um, but it was one of the first, and probably was one of the proximal causes of Linux starting to be widely used. So some big names in Linux would be Linus Torvalds. He's the creator of Linux, and he's extremely passionate. Um, perhaps we could replace the word passionate here with extremely profane. Um, he's known to frequently um, curse out the entire Linux developers mailing list when you find something that he's not happy about. Um, they say that he he had two major projects that he worked on over the course of his life, one being Git, the other being Linux, and they say that they named both of the projects after himself. 
Um, if you're not familiar with the word git, it's a British word which means an unpleasant person. So kind of give you an idea of what's going on there. Another big name that you'll hear about is the GNU project. GNU is short for GNU is not Unix. Um, the more that you get into computer science, the more you'll see that there are acronyms that are kind of recursive in a sense, like this one. Um, GNU does a lot of stuff. They provide what's called basically the user land tools, things like copy, move, um, list directory, all of those tools that you use on a regular basis, they were probably GNU projects at some point. Um, they also are very famous for what's called the GNU public license or the GPL, which is probably one of the most powerful and popular licenses amongst open source software. Um, another guy to know about is Greg Carot Hartman. Um, he is the developer of the stable branch of the Linux kernel, which basically means that he's the one responsible for preparing taking the kernels that Linus and his team develop and kind of help transform them into something that will be more useful for average day consumers. Basically, he's kind of the gatekeeper that decides when kernels get shipped out to Ubuntu and Canonical and Red Hat and some of the other teams. Uh, he is significantly more approachable than Torvalds uh, and does a lot kind of outreach community sort of things. So. Now let's get into some important terms. Kernel is the part of the operating system, the part of Linux, which interacts with your PC's hardware. So the thing that turns on your screen to the thing that reads the data off of the CD drive and loads it onto your hard disk, all of this is done underneath the covers by the kernel. Um, it provides what are called a series of system calls, basically think of them as functions that the kernel provides, which allow you to do different things like sending files, reading stuff off the disk, it's just generally a useful thing to have. You should also be aware of the shell. Um, whenever you start a terminal, that puts you into what's called a shell. The shell is basically an environment and a set of tools that you use to do things on a Linux system, um, even when you don't necessarily have a graphical user environment. Um, most Linux systems, bash is the default shell. Some other shells exist, such as ZSH, SH, KSH, CSH. Um, the differences amongst these vary. Um, and if you're interested in shells, we have another presentation that we can give on shells at a later date. Um, another thing you should be aware about is Grub. Grub is the most common bootloader in Linux. Um, the bootloader is the process, is the program that installs itself onto your hard drive in order to load the Linux kernel. So basically think of it as the thing that kind of gets everything ready in order to actually do stuff on your computer. Um, hopefully, it's one of those things that you see flash in front of your screen whenever you turn your computer on and it stays there for a little while and then completely disappears after that and you hopefully never see it again. Um, but when it's not working, it is kind of an important thing to know about. One last really important term that we want to go ahead and define at this point is what's called the path variable. Um, the path variable is a shell environment variable that tells the computer where to look for executable programs. Um, for example, when you type CD, or not CD, CD is a built-in, but if you type some program like, say, gedit, gedit is a program which is located probably at user bin gedit. Um, but you don't have to type user bin gedit in order to start gedit. You just type gedit and it works. The reason why is because of the path variable. Um, some other things that you should be aware about are version control systems like Git, SVN, and Mercurial. These are basically tools that allow you to manage and modify source code so that you can track them in a reliable way. The Linux kernel itself uses Git, um, and if you want to browse the Linux source code, you can actually go to um, git.linux.org, I believe. Git.kernel.org. Git.kernel.org, where you can find all of the Linux sources and various things. Um, if you've ever used Handin for any of your labs, that uses Mercurial on the back end. Something else you should be aware of about are auto tools and make files. These are basically on the source based distributions of Linux, the ones where you have to kind of install everything from source. Um, you're going to see make and make files be really important. These are basically files that contain collections of rules as to why you should or how to build software that you may need to use. Um, speaking of building from source, how exactly do you do that? 
So if your project is use, if the project's using auto tools, which is probably the most common way for software to be distributed in a Linux environment, generally you download the source files, you sometimes have to extract it from a tar file, um, we'll talk about tar in a minute. Then you run a script called dot slash configure, issue the command make, and then if it's your own computer, you can say sudo make install, which will then install the program on your computer. Um, the reason why you have to say sudo here is to ask for additional privileges to actually put the files into the appropriate directories. Um, generally, you'll also see a file called readme uh, available in most source distributions. The readme file details special build instructions or things that you may need to do first. So if you're trying to do something with a source program and doesn't work, the readme is a good place to check. Um, you'll also see the expression RTFM um, on various development sites that you may visit regarding Linux. Um, it has another meaning, but you can generally think of it meaning read the fantastic manual. <laughs> um, and this readme is part of that manual that you're supposed to be reading. Um, let's speak briefly on something called packaging systems. So how many of you have installed programs on Windows before. Okay. So when you install a program on Windows, you notice that you double click on the EXE, it brings up this thing, and then it downloads the program, and then it opens up this thing called Install Shield, and Install Shield yells at you and says, you're an awful person. Get your administrator to install this. Give me a password. Then it finally gets out of your way and installs it. And then you're left with this annoying little thing that stays in your system tray forever and then constantly trying to think, oh, by the way, I have an update now. And it, there's no kind of coherent system for installing things. On the Linux and Unix systems, they fixed that problem back in the 80s. And the solution to that is what's called packaging systems. Um, these allow you to basically install programs such as Firefox, LibreOffice, terminals, SSH, basically anything that you can think about, you can probably install it through the packaging system. And when you need to update them, you get a single notification that says, hey, there's updates available for the system. And that's it. There's one common place where all of your updates are handled, and you don't have to worry about it. Something that Windows would probably benefit if it actually finally implemented. Um, so how exactly do you do this? So the most common package manager that you're going to see and if you had administrator privileges on the lab machines, which you would see here, is what's called APT, or the Advanced Packaging Toolkit. This is the one that's used on all of the Debian distributions. The big thing that you need to know is how to install stuff. So APT git is the command used to um, install software in a system using the Advanced Packaging Toolkit. A um, couple commands that you need to be aware about, APT git update updates the metadata, basically information about what packages are available. If you're searching for a per trying to search for something and you don't get any results, you may want to make sure to update your metadata first. That way you have the most recent versions of the metadata on your system when you go to make queries against it. I said that you could search this metadata. Well, how do you do that? You use that through the apt cache command. So for example, you could do apt cache search Firefox, and then it would return the names of all the Firefox related packages. Likewise, you could do apt cache search FTP to find any file transfer protocol clients that may exist. So if you need to find a piece of software, apt cache search is how you do that. Once you know what you want, you use apt git install to install the package. Uh, so apt git install bsftpd and then it would install a very secure file transfer protocol daemon, uh, just as an example. You can also use apt git dist upgrade, which will then go out and update all of the packages that are on your system. Um, I believe Debian and some of the other distributions also have a tool that allows you to manage this through the graphical interface and also automatically do the update upgrade pattern to make sure that your system is up to date for you. So you don't have to manually manage all of this. Um, some other packaging systems that you should be aware about. DNF is the one used on all of the newer Red Hat flavored operating systems. 
Um, Pac-Man is what's used on Arch Linux. You may also see RPM floating around. RPM is the legacy package manager used behind the scenes on Yum, DNF, and SUSE distributions. So it's a very important command to be familiar with, even if you're not necessarily using it on a regular basis. So with that said, I'm going to hand it back over to Marshall to talk about the Linux file system. All right, so the Linux file system is actually very quite different from what you might be used to if you used Windows in the past. There is no concept of different lettered drives. There's no C drive, D drive, anything like that. You'll find everything that's currently available to you on the file system under what's called the root directory, which is often denoted by a single forward slash. So all of your personal files will live in a subdirectory under the root directory called home. And under home, there'll be another directory that is named after your username, usually. And that is where all your files will, will live. There is a, other important directories that include one called dev. You usually don't have to mess with this directory. This is a spe also a special file system where all of your devices that are connected to the computer are shown. So things like mouses, keyboards, uh, your graphics card, uh, PCI devices, Ethernet, your terminals, things like that will show up under there. Under the MNT directory, which is often pronounced mount, is usually where you can mount other file systems. Under USR is where you'll find most of your user land things, such as your libraries, your binaries that you use when, when you're in multi-user mode, and even on the, the BSD, you'll also, uh, you'll also actually find your home directories under there as well. And the slash bin directory is where you'll find a lot of system binaries that need to be available at boot time. So those are usually mission critical binaries. So like I touched on earlier, I didn't really fully uncover this, but under any Unix-like system, everything is represented as a file. Like I said, your keyboard, your terminal, your mouse. Everything is a file. Uh, even directories are files. If you open up a directory in an editor, you'll actually get a listing of the files and other subdirectories that are under them. Your executables are also just files. Everything is a file under Unix. So you don't usually see file extensions appended to <coughs> binaries in Linux. File extensions are there to categorize and not restrict. Because everything in Linux is a file, you'll also find other executables in the form of things like scripts written in things like Born Shell and Perl and Python that you can also execute just as if you're executing another binary. So files starting with a dot, like dot bash rc, are usually hidden from listings. These types of files are for the shell to read and execute before it actually hands it over to you so that you can actually tell the computer what you would like it to do. And you can also alias binaries. So this is actually an alias under the default school of computing's bash rc. If you open up and you put your bash rc to its default, you'll actually see a command like alias sl to ls, which will actually run ls when you accidentally mistype and type sl. But this is just an executable that's found within the path. All right, terminal power. So let's say you messed up, uh, you forgot to bound that loop, it's running an infinite loop, it's stuck, what do you do? Well, you don't have to shut off the computer. You can just hit Control C. Control C will often get you out of pretty much anything, most of the time. If you ever want to see what directory you're currently running in, the PWD command will actually print the current working directory that your name stands for. Whenever you're ready, Whenever you're ready to move out of the directory that you're currently in into another directory, the CD command, which is often built into the shell, is going to take you to a different directory so that you'll have a different reference for where you are. The popular ls command, which you might find yourself executing all too often after you execute CD, will give you a listing of all files that are currently in your directory. And there are a couple of popular options that come with ls as well, including dash l. If you append bash l to this command, it'll actually give you a nice alphabetized list of, of the files in the directory. There's also, well, along with the dash l, you'll find that a lot of information gets printed out. So 
you, you find things like the permission on the file, the owner, the group owner, the file size, the date that it was last touched, along with the timestamp, and of course the name of the file. There's also the dash a file, which will show hidden files, which are usually denoted by a dot prepended to the file name. So one thing you might have to get used to if you're coming from Windows is that once you delete a file under any Linux system, that's it. It's gone. And there is no trash can, and if you don't have backups, you won't be seeing that file again anytime soon. So you can try to run RM on a directory, but that won't work. You have to delete a directory in a special way. You have to actually append the dash R flag to it, and that'll actually recurse into the directory and actually start deleting the files, and then after it finishes deleting files, it will remove the directory. It's a special thing to Unix. If you ever want to rename a file, there's a command called move mv to move a file to a different name. So to do that, you can type mv, the original name of the file, and then the name that you want to move it to. The cp command is for copy if you ever want to make a duplicate of a file. So often if you make a change to a configuration file and you want to make a backup right click, well, you can run cp. cp, the original name of the file, the name that you want to copy it to. Be aware though that copy will overwrite a previous file unless you specify it not to clobber any files that already exist. You might find yourself doing this with source code often, but if you find yourself doing it with source code, you might want to look into using a version control system. So just a second, Marshall touched on the fact that you need to pass rm cac r directory in order to delete a directory. Why do you think that is? So I've drawn up here what could be a sample file directory. So what happened if what would happen if we deleted slash home slash usr1 right now? Well, we would lose our ability to get to slash home slash usr1 file. So the only way that we'd want to ever delete this usr1 directory would be if file no longer existed. So the dash r sends for recursive. If you don't know what recursion is yet, I'm sure Dr. Dean will be more than happy to explain it to you once you get to 2.12. Um, but suffice it to say, if you were to execute rm tac r slash home usr1, what that will do is it'll first delete file, and then it will delete home usr1 leaving the file system in this state, like so. So, it's <laughs> often the case with command that there are multiple things that you can do with the command if you want to slightly modify its behavior like we just saw before with rm-r. There are other options available in other commands that will allow you to do different things with them. So, it is usually the case that commands offer two different kinds of flags where you can append just a single letter like rm-r or uh, a longer flag which, which will have you type out a number of characters afterwards. So I think the extended command for rm-r is rm-recursive maybe? Yes. If you ever want a list of those, you can actually just type in the command usually in dash h or dash dash help. So, Let's say you type in the command in dash h or dash dash help, and it gives you a short description of what the command does, but that's not enough. You don't exactly know what the command does even after reading what's given to you in help. You can actually use what's called the man pages to find out more about a command and all its options. So we have the ls man page right here, and it gives you a listing of all the options and a very verbose description for each option you can specify. You can also even man the man page to get more information on the man pages. There's also the common flag dash v or dash dash verbose. If you ever want to see more information about what a utility or program is doing. So here are some symbols that you probably need to know if you're going to be using Linux. So the first one is just a single dot, and that is a shortcut to say 
the current directory. So oftentimes you'll see this when you're trying to execute a program that you just built or a script that you just wrote. So if you were to type in the name of the program that you just compiled without the dot slash in front of it, what the shell actually does is it goes and looks in your path variable, which lists everywhere it can find the utilities and scripts that are installed in the system, and it'll come back and say, I don't know what that is. So you actually have to direct the shell to say, in the current directory, there is this file called this, I want you to execute it. The dot dot here just means the parent directory, so if you ever want to jump back up to the directory that you were just in before you change directory into a subdirectory, you could type in cd dot dot to jump back up to its parent. Like we mentioned at the beginning, just a single forward slash means the root directory where everything on the file system is. The tilde is your home directory, so you can type in cd space tilde, jump to your home directory, or as a shortcut, you can simply type cd enter to your home directory. The exclamation point, exclamation point here, is you'll usually hear it pronounced as bang bang, funny, to execute the command that you just entered. So if you ever need to recompile something really quickly and you just entered the GCC command to do that, you can type in bang bang to run GCC again. If you ever execute a command that you actually meant to execute as the super user, you can actually just type sudo bang bang and it'll execute with privileges. So oftentimes in a shell, characters have special meaning and sometimes the shell will interpret something incorrectly. <clears throat> to get out of that, you have what's called an escape sequence. And escape sequences are usually denoted by the first character being a single backslash. So some special escape sequences that you may want to know. You're probably familiar with the backslash in escape sequence, which will force the terminal to start on a new line. There's also <coughs> backslash and then actually a space. So you'll often, if you love naming your files with spaces in them, you will find yourself typing backslash space a lot. Because if you do not type backslash space, the terminal, your shell will actually interpret that the next set of characters is actually a different argument. So you'll have to communicate to the shell that this is not a new argument, this is actually a continuation of the, of the argument that I am currently typing in. If you ever just want to insert backslash for some reason, backslash backslash will be your friend for that. And there's also some other special things that you can do that you'll probably run into if you're running, if you're running shell scripts. So this command right, well, this construct right here will actually run the command that you put in here and will actually return your string with the result. So if you ever want to assign the output of a command to a variable, that can help you with that. And there's also, if you append an ampersand to the end of a command, it will actually send the command to the background. So if you're going to execute a long RM or something, and you don't want to wait the five minutes for it to finish executing before going on and doing something else. You can just type in the ampersand after the command and it will send it to the background and you can continue typing. But beware that the output from the ARM command, if, you, if it does output something, will still come out. If you type dash V, you'll, you should be prepared for a, a lot of output from ARM and it will probably interrupt your typing work. So you might want to append something like a quiet flag to make the command shut up as it does its work. So in Linux, files can be opened and closed and are passed around as what are called file descriptors. Everything's a file. And Linux actually provides you with three default file handles, 0, 1, and 2, which are standard in, standard out, and standard error, respectively. And you can actually use those while you're programming, you use them C out and C++ and print out in C, pretty well known. And there are also a couple of commands that you can use to get contents out to the terminal. So if, you ever, if you're ever writing a script, you want to print something out really quickly, there's a command called echo that does exactly as its name suggests. It will take an input from whatever file you specify and it will echo it to the terminal. By default, echo will take in from standard input, I believe, and it will print out whatever you type in. There's also the cat command if you ever want to see the contents of a file. 
it'll actually print out the contents of any file that you specify, so you can print out the contents of a binary file if you want to. You'll actually see some of the strings that are in the binary file, which is kind of cool. But it will print out the contents to the terminal. You can also redirect the contents, which we'll discuss in a little bit, to another file of the user, to the inside of the program. So another couple of useful commands. One of them is called grep. Grep revolves around using what are called regular expressions. And regular expressions are a very powerful tool to use when you are searching large bodies of text. You can actually specify a regular expression and it will go looking through the text file and it will print out whenever it finds a match. By default, it will print out the entire line that matches. And less will actually read by default from standard input, and it will actually produce a scrollable output. So if you have a command that produces a lot of output and some of it scrolls off the terminal screen, well, uh, it's gone, but you can actually execute the command again. And if you do what's called piping that to less, which we'll talk about in a moment, you can actually see the contents and scroll through as fast or as slowly as you want to. So what exactly is piping and redirection? This is where the power of the Unix philosophy comes in, which states that programs should do one thing and they should do them well. So if you follow that philosophy, what this allows you to do is it allows you to take the output of one command and make it the input of another. So let's say, like, like I said earlier, with the less command, if you had a command that produced a lot of output, you can pipe that output to less, and less will paginate it for you. And let's say if you were downloading a file from the internet with the curl program and you wanted to just search the web page that you downloaded for a piece of text really fast, well, you could actually pipe the output of curl, which would be the web page, through the grep command and type in your regular expression, and it will actually search the web page for you. Also, there's redirection. So sometimes you don't want the output of a program to go to standard out. Sometimes if it produces a lot of output, if you want to save that output for later, or if you want to use that same output multiple times, you can do what's called <laughs> redirecting. So you can redirect standard input, output, and error. If you just use the program name and then a single right angle bracket, that will redirect standard output to a file. And so that file's contents will be filled with whatever that program has said. But be aware, though, that a lot of programs, as well as printing to standard out, will also print to standard error, which is oftentimes where they'll print if they encounter some kind of warning or a problem that they need to, to alert you of. To redirect standard error as well, you'll need to prepend some special characters before the right angle bracket. <laughs> If you ever have a file that has some output and you just want to add output to that file, you don't want to truncate the entire file and just blow out the contents that were there previously, if you use two angle brackets, that will actually just append the contents to the file. And like I mentioned earlier, so if you ever want to redirect standard air as well as standard out to the file, if you prepend the ampersand to the right angle bracket, that will help you out for that. And then again, if you only want to append both standard output and standard error to the file, you can use the ampersand and the two right angle brackets. If you ever want to use input from a file for a program, then you can actually use the left angle bracket after the program's name and the file that you want to use as input. So this is actually a way of implementing a sort of piping system, if you will. So if you ran a man, output is output to a file, and it took that output and then ran into another program. So if you ever want to see a file or a command that you ran in the past, then you can actually go through your his what's called the history. If you use the history command, it will print out previously entered commands that you had typed in, and you can actually pipe the output of history to something like less if you just want to scroll through as slowly or fast as you want. Or you can grab through it to search your command history if you don't remember, you remember sparsely what you typed in. And 
some shells will actually allow you to search the history. So if you press Control R on a decently modern shell, it'll actually pull up a prompt for you to begin typing a command. And it'll actually search the history for you and try to match your input with the closest command that it finds in the history. So the shell, like a lot of programs, are highly are highly customizable. So the default shell on the School of Computing Machines is Bash, and Bash runs through a number of files before it actually hands the prompt off to you. One of the most important of those files is the .bash RC file. Other shells also have their own configuration files. <coughs> I'm not sure if one for K shell, but for Z shell is .c shell RC. It's and also .k shell RC. Okay, so it's also .k shell RC. One of the cool things that you, you can do in the bash RC, and you'll actually see if you've left your bash RC default, is that you can alias commands. So in the, in, excuse me, in the, uh, in the bash RC, you'll see a bunch of aliases that are there by default. One of the most popular of them is ls, so a lot of times I'll mistype ls and type sl, but that will also that'll correct to ls. There are no aliases in this bash RC. There you go. So Robert here, the dot for Fafa, has a number of aliases. For three dots, he's, he specifies that when he types in three dots into the shell, it means to go up two directories. When he types four, go up three. When he types five, go up four. And he also has a number of commands, alias, to make his life easier. Just like the TD5. What? Uh, it's uh, just like uh, define. Oh, pound, pound define. define. Yeah, yes. it's basically like pound define. Yes. Pound define is very nice. <coughs> so, like I mentioned earlier, the man pages are highly useful in a lot of ways. Not only can you search the man pages for commands that you may be unfamiliar with, but you can also actually use the man pages on some on the header files for the standard C library and a lot of the functions that are in the kernel. So if you were to type in man standard io.h, that pull up a function signature for standard for a uh, sorry, that's not a header. I mean a function that's a header. It'll present to you a, a list of functions that are within the header file along with their prototype, so you can learn how to use them. And I don't think are they uh, are the function descriptions included in the man page here? So this is man three printf. So the Linux definitions of the standard library functions are in the third section of the manual. So you say man three printf. If you wanted um, stir rtoke, you would say man three stir rtoke. Uh, but it gives you the function prototypes as well as a description of what the arguments that it accepts and what the function roughly does. Cool. <laughs> okay, so another awesome command is if you have an alias sl to ls like I have, sl. If They've actually installed, installed it. Huh? They've uninstalled it. They've uninstalled it? It's a shame. <laughs> If you install SL or if it comes pre-installed on uh, in your respectable Linux system, this will actually summon a Steam Love motor that will power across your screen, which is actually pretty cool. Which one? What was that? Which one? Uh, SL. 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 Well, I think Robert said maybe. They have uninstalled it. Uninstall it. Okay. SL is a shorter form of the selector. The, 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 the previous page. The what? Uh, SL is a is a short term, short term, short form of short form of the previous page. On the previous page. Oh yeah, right, there was right. an alias that was on the previous page. So yeah. basically, they used to have a program called SL installed on the lab machines that took like five seconds of your life to show a steam locomotive just chugging slowly across the side from one side of your terminal to the other side. If that annoyed you, you could use the command on the previous page and you would just get the text steam locomotive instead of the actual train chugging across your stream. Um, so if you wanted to get your life back, you could use the alias that we had on the previous slide. <laughs> All right, 
right? So there's also a command called touch. What the touch command does, if you list a file <coughs> after the touch command, it will create the file. If it did not exist, that file will be empty. Or if the file does exist, it will simply update the file access and modified times. I don't think the modified times, it'll update the file access time. There's also this, this OK editor called Vim that you can use if you really want to. There's also Nano, which is a very simple text editor. A lot of people might be using it when they're just starting out using Linux. And also down here, that's cut off. That's actually curl, which is the program that I was talking about <laughs> earlier that allows you to download files and web pages and things from the internet. The tar command has caused many computer science majors grief. We have a relevant XKCD comment. Suffice it to say, TAR's command architecture and flags are kind of arcane. Um, you feel like you're summoning Cthulhu whenever you're saying, giving a valid TAR command. So um, in fact, I think I've actually given a TAR command that had Cthulhu as an argument. So just be aware that, that it, it's really obnoxious. The yeah. most common ones are. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> You won't need to know an extensive amount of TAR commands to get through your life here. One of the more popular ones are XCF, which will extract a GZ compressed archive that is specified after the command. If you if the if the file is not GZ compressed, then you can omit the Z file dash <coughs> XF. If you want to compress a number of files into a TAR gzip file, then you can use the dash czf flags. And what you will do with this one is after the f, you will specify what you want to name the archive that you'll create. And then after the name of the archive, then you'll list the files that you want to tar on. And if you think tar is bad, you can try to use cbio. Why is that what you have to use on BSD systems? No, <laughs> we use BSD tar. <laughs> So if you find yourself using a number of commands repeatedly, or if you're just tired of doing something over and over again, you can write a shell script. You can write commands into a file, mark that file as executable, and run it like you would any other program. Your shell will actually go through, it will open up the <coughs> file, and it will look at what's called the, I forget what it's called, but it will, the command interpreter. So these first two characters are necessary, if you omit them, then the shell will have no idea what program to invoke to read the script. So if your interpreter is Python, you'll use shebang slash bin slash whatever your Python interpreter is. If it's Perl, shebang slash user bin Perl. Uh, in this case, it's bash, which is located at bin bash. So you will need that as the first line in order to get it to run the script properly. If you do not specify this line, then you will need to manually invoke your interpreter. So in this case, if you omitted the shebang slash bin slash bash here, then you have to type bash and then the name of the script to execute that script. It is common to have one command per line. If you want more than one command per line, you can add a semicolon to the end of each command. And after you finish writing the script, like I said, you need to make it executable. So you can run the chmod command, which will modify your permissions, which we will get to in a moment, to allow executing this script. Because by default, on Linux Unix-like systems, things are not executable. So let's talk about getting owned by permissions. Um, permissions are kind of <laughs> annoying, but they're also a fact of life. Um, it basically stems from the fact that Linux systems, unlike Windows systems, are really designed to be used by a whole bunch of people at the same time. Um, proving once again that Linux is more robust than Microsoft's operating system ever will be. Uh, but basically what it boils down to is that users are unique accounts. Root is the super user and can pretty much do whatever he wants. Um, don't try to use Root on the lab machines. You will get reported automatically by the system and they will come and find you. Um, 
Trust me, it does actually happen. Um, if you want to run a single command as root, you can say su, which stands for super user do, followed by command. You can also temporarily gain login either by saying sudo su or alternatively sudo dash i, which means sudo to an interactive session. Uh, <laughs> so, important commands to know about. So, one other thing to know about it users are usually in groups of the same names. So, basically, users who are in the sudoers group can use sudo. On Red Hat systems, you may see this called wheel for whatever reason. I think that's kind of a legacy. The big wheel. Yeah, reason why that's the case. Um, if you want to know more about these commands, I would recommend looking at the documentation for chmod and chgroup. Um, chmod modifies permissions on files. chgroup modifies groups for files. You might probably also want to know about chown, which modifies the user that owns a file, uh, for more information on exactly how this works. So let's talk briefly about working from other machines. So what you can do is you can say ssh username at access.cs.clemson.edu and that, what that will do is it will create a remote login session for your username on access which is the kind of head node for Clemson. Uh, so once you've done there you'll get a message which, which is called the message of the day um, which will tell you about all of the other systems that are available on the Clemson computer science department and then you can SSH from there to another machine. Um, I will note, you do not want to run or compile anything on access.cs.clemson.edu. The reason for that is because it's a shared system. That means if you take up all of the processing power on access, every other person who's SSH'd through access will become very angry with you. Um, and I believe they already they have a system in place that if you start taking up the processor for too much time, it'll actually kill your connections. So general rule of thumb, try not to do your work on access. Go to access and then SSH to the appropriate machine inside of that. Also, not all of the utilities are available on access, so you won't be able to do too much. So um, another thing that you can do potentially is use a virtual machine. Um, if you're on a Windows or a Mac, you can use a program called VirtualBox, which is available for free under the GPL v2. Um, and you can use that to run a Linux virtual machine. Um, also BSD, Lumos, a couple other different operating systems can be run in this. You can even run Windows if you feel particularly like a masochist. But um, just be aware that it exists as an option. We run Zubuntu here, 12.04. We're looking at updating at some point in the near future. But for the time being, 12.04 is what we're using here. Um, I do recommend that you do compile and test on a lab machine prior to submission because you never know if you accidentally left out a needed library or something like that that's not available on the lab machines. Um, you may hear something about SIGWIN and MIGGW. Um, these are programs that give you a bash-like environment on a Windows system. Short answer is bad idea. Um, the libraries for these are not updated very often, if ever, and the POSIX compatibility layer for Windows hasn't been maintained since the 90s. So short answer, don't bother. Um, use one of the other methods, which will give you a more genuine Linux experience. So j just still allow Marshall to wrap us up quickly. <laughs> so wrapping up, um, don't try to use sudo on a lab machine. It's like my cohort, Robert, just said it won't work, and your name will be printed to the log files, and somebody may contact you. I uh, don't think there are many classes here where you're writing shell scripts, but even so, you probably shouldn't try to cheat, because we use software here to build computing that can check for plagiarism, and you will get yelled at sufficiently by a number of people, and maybe evicted. If you ever want to see something installed on the School of Computing Systems, you can actually submit a ticket to IT Help at Clemson.edu, put School of Computing in the subject line, and then enter your complaint slash request. So like I said earlier, armed files are gone for good, essentially. But 
here, here in School of Computing, we have a snapshot system that's implemented by our snapshot, I believe. But <laughs> what you can do with this system is you can actually look back in time for a set amount of intervals. So I, I'm not exactly sure of the snapshot intervals, but there's one every hour, I believe, uh, and your hourly, nightly, and weekly backups of your files in your home directory. So you can go into the dot snapshot directory and see all of these. <coughs> Also, being a school computing student, or actually a Clemson student at all, you can take advantage of public web hosting. So in the School of Computing, you have a personal website that'll be under your username. It's in the directory called public underscore HTML. If you navigate to people.cs.clemson.edu slash tilde and then your username, what will come up is your personal website. So you can actually customize this. You can uh, write uh, HTML and some CSS from JavaScript. I don't think they do server side scripting. Uh, you can use PHP, Perl, uh, really? and Python. Oh, okay. I was unaware of that. <laughs> yep. But after you finish writing, creating these files, you want to make sure that you change the permissions on them because by default, files that you create in school computing are only accessible to you and administrators. Uh, other, the world cannot see them, so you'll need to give all people read permissions on the files, and you also need to do the same for the directories as well. So up here at the front of the room, we have a cheat sheet of commands printed out for you. If you ever find a command and you don't exactly understand what it does, you've looked at the help, you look at the man pages, there's an empty website called explainshaw.com, and you can actually copy and paste the command into the website, and it'll actually break up the command for you and show you all the important bits of it. If you game, we're on Steam, and we're also intermittently on Freenode at pound Clemson ECM. If you ever need to get in contact with any of our administrators and system programmer, they are in the main hallway and around the School of Computing. <coughs> any questions? We have about five minutes left for questions. So, any questions? I wonder what's your environment to use uh, Linux? What's your, I wonder what's your uh, developer environment? What's the development environment? Is that what you're just asking? Yes. Um, so, you may have used Windows or some of the other operating systems in the past and you're used to having what's called an integrated development environment. Um, this is basically a set of tools that exist to make programming easier, easier. Usually it's in a graphical environment. On the Linux machines, you will not for the most part find that these are installed. Um, there are two of them installed on the lab machines that I'm aware of. One is Eclipse, which is primarily designed for C++, but we also have it configured to do, or primarily designed for Java, but we also have it configured to do C++ development. So if you're looking at that, that would be an option. There is also a develop, integrated development environment called Genie, which is installed on the lab machines. Um, For the most part, students here will use their favorite text editor, which is unfortunately Gedit. I recommend <coughs> against using Gedit because it is too general purpose. Uh, I recommend using either Vim or Emacs for a general purpose text editor find that they are far more powerful than Gedit. And usually, you use the Mac. So I actually run Linux on this. So you're running OS 10 right now. Yeah, checking. right now I'm using OS 10 because I need uh, video recording software so that we can record the screen for this. But I traditionally use Arch Linux on my what, Mac. I use Arch Linux on my Mac. And all of your work uh, could be done on Mac. Um, so you must part. Yeah, there's a couple things that you want to watch out for. For example, the GNU versions of some of the commands will not compile on a Mac. Uh, for example, if you use a printf, uh, that requires a GNU pound define, which is not packaged in the Mac standard libraries. Uh, there's also a couple other. GNU extensions to the 
um, standard library commands which are not available. So if you find yourself using any of those extensions, you will need to compile on a Linux machine, and a Mac machine will not be sufficient. If you're in one of the classes that does iOS development, there are Macs available for doing that in the lab, but you can get your stuff done without necessarily using a Mac. Can we tap back to the, um, <coughs> the slide about the personal website, so I can take a picture real quick? Um, actually, these slides will be available online at our Clemson ACM webpage. So if you want to go to um, cs.clemson.edu slash ACM slash seminars, <laughs> you will see a listing of all of the seminars that we've given in the past with slides and in some cases video of what we've done, um, as well as kind of a list of what presentations we're looking at doing in the course of this semester. So you can find the slides for this video, or for this class, available right here under Linux is Scary, and we will also add the links up here as they become available. Um, the video will probably not be ready until March, though. What's the date of our next seminar, such as Sync Defect? OK, so we're going to be giving, if you ever want to know the dates of any of our events, on the seminars page, there's a link to the calendar, which has a calendar of all of our events. So if you want to know when we're giving seminars and what they're on and where they're located, um, take a look here. We try to keep it fairly up to date. So um, if you want to know when we're doing stuff, um, to answer your question shortly, our next seminar is next Monday. It is going to be on an introduction to firewalls. So. Uh, firewalls are commonly used in network security. Uh, we'll be talking about three open source firewalls, PF, IP tables, and firewall D. Firewalls. Yes. Um, if you want to know more about those, we'll be happy oh, to have firewall. you. Oh, firewall. Oh, the firewall on the internet, on the networks. Yeah. Yes. So we'll be talking about that next week. <laughs> and uh, uh, the LAN <coughs> on January 20th. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have a LAN party this coming Saturday where we'll be talking, or we'll be playing video games. So if you want to come out and play video games, we'll be happy to have you join us. You are great. Okay, so I wrote down a couple different bash commands that you could potentially use. These are some ones that I use on a quasi-regular basis. So just some things to, be know, to know about. Um, we talked about parameter expansion. So basically when you have a sub-command that you want to run first um, to do something. So what this command does is it will open up the file foobar.sh as long as it is somewhere on the file system. So if I forgot where, example, for example, where I put the file, but I know the name of the file, I can open it up in Vim with a command like this. Uh, you could also replace this slash with something like uh, slash home r underwood or something like that in order to search a specific subdirectory. Um, this is particularly useful if you are programming in Java, <coughs> um, where you have to have like this annoying directory structure for any project that you happen to be working on. Um, but this will make this a lot less painful for you. Um, additionally, you could do like star.java. Yeah. And what that would do is open all of the Java files that are in a child of your current directory. Um, this command right here will find all files that are world writable and then remove the ones that are in the binaries directory and then put the list into your standard editor. Um, if you ever see vim with a minus after it, that means read from standard n as the file. So uh, the top one finds, <coughs> if you don't put a file path that just searches the current directory, yes. put a file path. Yeah. If you're using a Mac, the second argument, that argument right here, which is by default dot on the GNU version, is not. So if you want your scripts to be BSD compatible, you do need to put a dot right there. Okay. Um, the next command will download a site, in this case google.com, filter it through Pandoc, which is a text conversion tool, and then put it into less. So if you want to have a poor man's web browser <laughs> in three bash commands, you, you can do that. Um, this command right here, no hup, no hup, um, yum update dash y, redirect to standard 
or dev null, and then ampersand will run an update on a Fedora 18 or older system and output the results to dev null. <coughs> so if you need to do updates, something that could potentially be useful, demonstrating both redirection and backgrounding of tasks. Um, one last command right here, um, just to demonstrate, you can actually write for loops in bash. So what this one will do is for i in docker ps-qa, which will return a list of all the docker containers on your machine. Um, so for each docker container that you have on your machine, do docker rm dollar i done. What this will do is it will execute docker rm multiple times, deleting all of the containers that are currently instantiated on your disk. So um, we could also do the same thing with doing replacing ps with images and then change this to rmi and this will delete all of the container images that you're not using. Okay. So, uh, any other questions about the shell, introductions to Linux, what you can use this stuff for, why you should care, 